Welcome to the show. This is the Magician and the Fool podcast, episode number 49. My name is Dominic. My co-host's name is Janice, and you will hear from him a little bit later. Today we are very fortunate to have Marlena Seven Bremner on the show. Don't call her Marlene. That's what the spelling of her name looks like, but it is Marlena. She is an artist, author, mystic, healer, Born in Frankfurt, Germany, she has a bachelor's in geography and environmental studies and is trained as a polarity therapist by the Institute of Holistic Health Careers. She is a self-taught oil painter exploring esoteric themes arising from the study and practice of hermeticism, alchemy, tarot, psychology, magic, astrology, shamanism, and mythology. And just something worth mentioning, for someone who is self-taught, And not only self-taught, but someone who started painting in their adult life. Uh, It's extremely impressive what she is doing. When you take a look at her artwork, um, it is kind of crazy to think that she didn't actually start painting until uh, a little bit later in life. It's, It's pretty cool. She developed her painting career in the Pacific Northwest, showing her work in both group and solo exhibitions along the West Coast, and eventually has relocated to New Mexico and has been there since 2019. Much of her writing can be found on her Patreon blog, and her first book, Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy, is now available for pre-order from Inner Traditions. We found... Marlena to be very insightful, very introspective, and very sincere. So anyone who's that sincere and invests that much energy into something like this, I think is worth listening to. As everyone knows, the Western esoteric tradition is a fragmented tradition without a clear and continuous line of transmission. So there are many people out there in the trenches, so to speak, doing the work to the best of their ability. And I think this is a case study of such an individual. Moving along, we always want to say thank you to our Patreon supporters who are crucial in keeping this work going, keeping this podcast running. If you are interested in joining our Patreon, just go to the website, look us up, and do what makes sense to you. We dedicate this to Hermes and Asclepius, and may any merits that we accumulate doing this work be distributed to all sentient beings so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening.
Okay, we are extremely honored and pleased to have Marlena Seven Bremner on the show, artist, visionary, practitioner. Very much looking forward to this. Welcome to the show, Marlena. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so grateful for you coming on. So let's start where we always start. Let's maybe have you talk about yourself a little bit, tell our audience who you are and how you got to where you are now as far as this kind of mystical journey that you're on. And in writing this book that we're going to talk about, you have a new book out, Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy, The Emerald Tablet, The Corpus Hermeticum, and The Journey Through the Seven Spheres, which I don't have yet, but I can't wait to read it. Yeah, well, I'm primarily an artist. I started with visual art, but um, as my art was progressing, I just became really interested in a lot of different ideas and you know, wrote them out to sort of wrap my head around them. And eventually that turned into the book, which originally was conceived of as one book and later became two books. So the book that you just referenced, uh, Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy, is the first book. And that one is due to come out in July of this year through Inner Traditions. And the second book is um, tentatively titled The Royal Marriage of Art and Alchemy. And that one I just completed the um, the manuscript for. So that one's awesome. in progress. And I'll have to go through the editing phase with that. And I think it's due to come out like winter of 2022. So yeah, I um, I wasn't always an artist. I was very artistic as a child. And I guess people would have said I was talented. Came from an artistic family on my mother's side. Um, sculptors, painters. And so there was a lot of art in my childhood. My mother was a really talented artist and her art was hanging up all over the house. Same with my uncle, Michael Ale, who was a famous artist up in Seattle at the time. But I didn't, I didn't really feel like I was good enough to pursue it as a career. It never really even occurred to me. So anyway, early on, I was interested in spiritual ideas and um, especially in my teen years, got into tarot and studying Eastern traditions, shamanism laying on of stones. I was really interested in natural healing. And this sort of progressed over the years. And I ended up going to school for geography and environmental studies rather than art. And it wasn't until much later that I I realized that I wanted to be an artist and started to take it seriously. Uh, And that's sort of when my spiritual interests and interest in art converged when I moved to Olympia around 2007. So how much has your environment influenced the kind of evolution of your your art? Do you feel like it plays a, a big role? Mm, yeah, definitely. Well, I, I lived in Colorado. That's where I went to school. And the reason that I moved up to the Northwest was um, I was tired of the sort of dry, fiery, windy environment that Colorado has. And I wanted water. I wanted big trees. I wanted the earth element. Mm-hmm. So I to the Northwest, and that's a really it's like a womb, you know, it's just really rich with plant life. It's really green everywhere. There's water everywhere you go. Uh, the clouds are really dynamic. The light is really beautiful. So it's, it's a really nurturing environment for the creative process. And so that's sort of where my creative desire sort of was born and nurtured, but it's also really dark up there. As people know, it rains a lot and it gets very, very dark in the winter. And that can sort of lead to a contractive inward inclination. And Mm -hmm. for me, uh, I went through, you know, different phases of that periods of depression, um, you know, seasonal depression and a lot of inward seeking, a lot of uh, looking at my own shadow and ego dissolution, ego breakdown. And I feel like that was a really, really crucial part of my development. And there was one particular instance that I, I often refer to because it was so pivotal in my um, transition to visionary art and alchemical art. And that was an experience with DMT. And at the time, I was going through a really difficult time, a lot of depression. And I, I had this inner sense that I needed to be broken open. I needed to be shattered because there was something in me that wanted to be expressed, but I couldn't access it. And I had a lot of self-doubt, you know, just a lot of um, insecurity. And sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear that, but my cat is trying to bury her food right now. (laughs) Uh, Good job. 
So yeah, I had a lot of insecurity and felt like I needed something to help me break that open. So I was sort of on a mission. I had that mantra in my head, I need to be shattered. So naturally when someone, I came across someone who had DMT and offered to let me try some, I jumped on the opportunity despite my usually cautious self who would have been, you know, concerned with setting up a ritual environment. I just did it on the fly and it basically propelled me out of myself. Uh, It was a complete ego dissolution. I lost all memory, all sense of self, whatever was me, my life that just completely dissipated and disappeared. And I had an experience of uh, what I equate with the prima materia, the the first matter, um, chaos, just pure chaos. And it was cold and it was indifferent and absolutely terrifying. Um, So I often talk about this as a near death experience because it really was, I felt like I had died and I truly was completely shattered. And when I came out of it, it was this sort of slow process of remembering who and what I was and where I came from. Starting immediately after that, my entire life changed. I, I started having panic attacks, anxiety on a regular basis, um, insomnia, incredible amounts of self-doubt, and all of the tools that I usually would turn to for self-regulation, you know, yoga, meditation, receiving body work, uh, going on long walks, all of these things just would trigger more anxiety and panic attacks. So I had to figure something else out. And what ended up happening was I came across Jung's work and his conception of alchemy. And I just immediately could see in his writing and what he was talking about the process that I was going through, this sort of like dark night of the soul. And at the same time, I was both studying polarity therapy. I was going to school for energy medicine and sort of learning about hermetic conceptions through that and also Eastern, you know, Ayurvedic practices and learning about the subtle body. But I was also just beginning to teach myself oil painting. And so there was this fusion of understanding the subtle body, understanding alchemy and alchemical processes and psychological processes of transmutation and and at the same time expressing this through my art. And so this is really where the, the visionary art was born. It started as a desire to portray energy. I really, from a young age, I you know, could sense that there was something more going on than this material reality. And I had a deep desire to express that in visual form or, you know, to be able to see it. So this is when I began to explore that in my work. And a lot of my early work was um, paintings of the chakras and energy lines and things like that, that I could see in in my own visions and it has sort of evolved as I learned more and more about hermeticism and alchemy. Do you feel like the art is actually a medicine? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It definitely has been for me. And truly painting was the only thing that helped me get through that time. And that lasted for about five years, but I slowly was able to, you know, integrate the experience and put myself back together again. I, uh, I don't use a lot of entheogens. Uh, that was really like such a powerful experience. It took me years to integrate and understand what it meant. And since then, I've been fairly cautious in, in the use of entheogens just because I feel like I, I got the message, you know, I, it, was, it was that powerful. Well, you know, I, I think that um, dreams are a method of vision or a, a form of perception. And I think that whether it's uh, ritual, entheogens, dreams, Art. I think these are all different ways to access the same interior reality. And I think that Jung's method of psychotherapy, which is widely misunderstood, um, is is another you know method of of entering into direct engagement with the interior reality and experiencing that process of transformation. I mean, it's funny. I I, I don't I don't want to go too far into this point, but Every time I see people criticize Jung, especially in the so-called occult world, I realize they really haven't probably read much Jung. Because if you read Jung, none of these criticisms even stand. It's like laughable. His work is some of the 
deepest material that you could read on esotericism oh, yeah. and psychology. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's so beautiful that that formed the bridge for you and you can see it in your art. I mean, your art is dynamic and deeply visionary. Um, and it's funny, there is clearly a personal element to it, but there is also a sort of universal element to it, which shows me that by going within, there's a saying like to, you know, to go, to go out, you have to go in, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like with your art, that's what's happening there. And then there's this almost like, I don't know. So I feel like almost a Paracelsian element to it. And, and just, there is a strong element of the Western mystery tradition in what you create. It's almost talismanic. Oh, well, yeah. It is talismanic. Yeah. Yeah, I do think of it that way. And I mean, in fact, many of my paintings are born in a talismanic way where I'm working with planetary timing and oh, zodiac wow. and intentionally invoking certain planetary energies into the painting. Well, that's um, entirely out alchemical because you're crystallizing the ray yeah. into a form. Yeah. And, you know, working with correspondence and also long periods of meditation and contemplation beforehand. And often what happens is it's sort of, it's half intentional and half unintentional. You know, I'll be meditating on a certain archetype and sort of contemplating, bringing different ideas together, synthesizing information as the idea for the painting is gestating. And then I'll become aware of some sort of, you know, celestial event that's coming up, maybe even the day of, and suddenly I'll know like, this is the time that I need to start the painting. And so in that case, often the painting is started in an automatic way, just very mm -hmm. spontaneous, letting the energies move through me. So all the work in preparation comes to a culmination in that moment. It's this sort of divine timing as the painting is birthed into reality. And when it's done that way, it's, it's often just so surprising to me what comes out. You know, it's like not at all what I expected, but so much more profound and beautiful. That's great. That, it's deeply beautiful. Honestly, it's what you just described is to me sacred, actually. And I would say that what you're describing is also the magician card of the tarot. I mean, you're, you're to me, the part beyond words beyond the words you were saying is that the mystery of the first arcanum now that leads me into a question i wanted to ask you um, about the creative process of the artist i wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on the creative process of the artist as analogous to the creative process of the godhead in producing reality it's such a good question and i've given it a lot of thought um through my work. And it's a large part of what I write about in both of the books, really. I think of, you know, the Godhead and the Hermetic or Neoplatonic conception as a undifferentiated unity. And a lot of cosmogenies talk about it that way. It's uh, complete in itself and yet completely undifferentiated. And what emerges from that through just the innate desire to know itself is the emergence of polarity and these sort of creative sexual forces, the opposites that are present in everything throughout the cosmos. And that's really like what we're all working with, right? In the world of duality, differentiation, um, these different polarities and cosmic forces coming together for the creation of new forms in reality. So from those two polarities emerges a third thing. And we can think of these in different ways. There's a million different, you know, names for the opposites. But one of the primary ways that I think about it is the, the conscious and the unconscious and the role that those two parts of our psyche play in the creation of reality around us. So the artist essentially is reaching into that undifferentiated state of pure potential of the one and retrieving information, bringing it into form through their artistic process, through the union of the conscious and the unconscious. And the way that plays out is it functions through the imagination. The imagination is sort of the medium. And in the Emerald Tablet, which is um, an ancient text described to Hermes, 
Um, it's got many translations, but essentially it's a concise explication of the process of creation as it's reflected both in the greater creation and in our individual ability to create from the imagination. And within that tablet, it talks about the one thing and the miraculous powers of the one thing. Basically that that which is above is like to that which is below, which is where we get that you know, famous axiom as above, so below. The correspondence between the creation of everything and the creation that we're able to accomplish through our individual lives. And all of this is from one, from the unity, the initial unity. I was just going to mention, you know, Henri Corbin um, mm-hmm. in his uh, explications of illuminationist uh, Sufism uh, talks about the mundus imaginalis. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was trying to differentiate because imagination has gotten kind of a bad rap, right? Like since the Enlightenment era, we tend to think of the imagination as what's unreal. Um, just fantasy, pure fancy, but truly it's like one of our most divine gifts. Like the French poet and art critic, Charles Baudelaire called it the queen of all the faculties without which none of the other faculties even matter. You know, it's the most important thing that we have within us. And that's why, you know, in the Emerald tablet, the one thing is like the central emphasis there is like, the imagination is that one thing that connects everything. It connects us with the cosmos and with the greater cycles of evolution that are going on. And it connects us with our own unconscious and those hidden aspects going on in the below. So it's through that imagination that we're able to translate from that ineffable unity and bring things into form. Cool. Cool. And and speaking of Corban, I, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about how what you were doing sounded, um, reminiscent of of the persians almost the the astrologers i was thinking of the picatrix and as i looked at some of your images i could i could see those images as being in the picatrix you know the picatrix has these outlandish and and (laughs) wild things like you know there's a woman with a snake coming out of her eye and she's sitting on a lion and what do you make because image was so important images and symbols as they they connected the above and the below through the imagination, what what do you make? What can you speak about as far as just images in general and symbols and uh, how they work for you and what you hope to accomplish through through them? If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think there's so much that can be portrayed through image that we can't absorb through words. Even though, like the the divine mind creates through the power of speech, right? The divine word, image is an aspect of that. And it's another way that we can sort of integrate and understand symbols that really reaches into that collective unconscious place within us and sort of transcends the the word. And I find that really powerful. You know, like you can look at an image and derive any number of narratives from it based on your own personal experiences, your understanding of, you know, different universal concepts or collective unconscious archetypes. but it becomes extremely individual and writing and the spoken word can be the same, but I feel like images are really much more powerful in that way. Carrying this thought forward, let's talk on your ideas about the connection between authentic alchemy, true alchemy and true artistry. Um, You know, as opposed to, it's funny, the, you know, magicians, alchemists, artists, you have, it's all Hermes ruled stuff and you have your charlatans, and then you have your genuine kinds of, you know, magicians, alchemists, artists. Um, But uh, the connection between authentic alchemy and true artistry and how this ties into creative demiurgy. Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess this goes back to what I mentioned about the prima materia and the prima materia being that initial chaos or undifferentiated potential and also equated with the unconscious and the work of alchemy authentic alchemy is it begins with that prima materia that first matter and goes through various stages of transmutation and i feel like the artist goes through the same processes and alchemy has been called the royal art for that reason it's a creative process and it 
you can see it reflected in the Hermetic teachings and also in the, the Emerald Tablet. Um, but essentially, you begin with that darkness, that beginning matter. And our work is to, to break that open and discover what's hidden inside and to bring it to its fullest realization through the creative process. And alchemy really teaches us the different ways that we can transmute and work with that energy. And when that's married with the creative process, whether you're working in a laboratory or in a studio with your art or writing or whatever your creative medium is, the processes can be understood differently. You know, if you're working in the laboratory, you're working with actual materials, metals or plants, and you're working in a retort to affect these transmutations. But if you're working like I do with paint or with writing, then, you know, your medium is different, but you're still working with those same processes of transmutation. And the important part, and this is where the imagination comes in and correspondence, is to be able to see the inner reflected in the outer and vice versa, and to have that dialogue between the inner and outer and the merging of the subjective and objective worlds. And that's really where that alchemical transmutative process comes into play because you're not just watching these transmutations in your retort, they're actually happening within you at the same time. And the same thing goes with art. You know, if you're creating art and at the same time being transformed by the art, then that's, that's a really powerful process that can guide one to the completion of the great work, the magnum opus. And this is a lot about, I talk about this a lot in the second book, which I recently completed, uh, The Royal Marriage of Art and Alchemy. And I go into the four stages of the magnum opus and how those are reflected in the artistic process. So beginning with that prima materia, the blackness of the beginning of the work, and that's called the negredo, which means blackening. And a lot of the alchemical texts will talk about when you see your matter going black, you know that you're at the beginning of the work. And for the artist, this often can be experienced as a, a melancholy, a state of a feeling of death or the dark night of the soul. And maybe not a very creatively productive time. You know, it might be a time of creative blocks and a lot of self-doubt and searching. And that's really what that Negredo is about. It's about going inward. It's an earth element, Saturnian inward contraction where we confront the shadow aspects of the self and we, we come into contact with what's hidden within us in our unconscious. And that can be a really scary and challenging experience. However, if you understand all of the stages, then, then you can see it as just part of the process. You know, we all need to rest and regenerate. Like life cannot exist without death. There's no genera generation without putrefaction. Like we need both. And that's a really vital, important part of the process. And that's why it's at the beginning. Um, but if we can sit with that, if we can like really face those difficult times with courage and fortitude and trust, then eventually it does transform and the creative process unfolds from that and generation begins. And so that negredo phase that begins the alchemical opus transitions into the albedo, which is a whitening. And it's also sort of, it's like the light coming at the end of the dark night, you know, the first glimmer of light on the horizon and the hope that enters the process, like, okay, well, it, maybe it's going to be all right, you know? And it's also the beginning of inspiration and um, emerging with the the watery feminine yin part of the process. So I equate the the process of dissolution with the second phase um, because that's where we sort of dissolve into the watery um, spirit of the cosmos, and we begin to see reality and our life in a symbolic way. And we see the connections between within and without. And if this is really extreme, it can even lead to a complete ego dissolution and, um, you know, psychotic breaks. But the point for the artist is to really walk that fine line, to be able to go into these states of disintegration and at the same time stay grounded. 
through the process so that we can translate the things that we confronted during the first phase of the negredo, these shadow aspects, and begin to make sense of them in a symbolic way and translate them eventually into a creative form. So the albedo is, it's really a time of, it's a, it's further going inward, but it's also bringing things outward. So the albedo eventually transitions into the citrinitas, which means yellowing. And this is where consciousness comes into the picture. So up to now, we've been sort of working with the unconscious. And now the conscious light is being infused into our work. And Jung would talk about this in terms of active imagination. So we're not just exploring the unconscious, the world of dreams and symbols, but we're actively engaging with it and coming to understand it and integrate it. So active imagination is one tool that we can use in a creative sense to enter into the unconscious, to dialogue with different figures that we meet there, and to you know, gain insight and deeper understanding of what our unconscious is, is asking of us, what it wants to communicate with us. So the Citrina test is, there's different processes that I equate with it in the book, and one of them is digestion. And in alchemy, digestion is a really important process because it's, it's, it appears throughout the work, but I, I put it with the citrina test because it's a process of maturation, um, a gentle heat applied to the matter, to the creative process, and a slow development over time, like the period of gestation. So things are maturing in our creative process. This can be seen as like, the development of a piece of art or a piece of writing, whatever we're working on. It's the, the phase where things are coagulating and coming together and being assimilated. And so in our psyche, this is the process of assimilation where we're digesting ideas, inspirations from the unconscious and from our consciousness and integrating everything into a new form. And so coagulation is also part of this process. And eventually that coagulation beget, begins to become even more solidified within us. And this is where we're transitioning into the final phase of the opus. And that's the rubedo or reddening. And this is where the, the opposites within us, these primal forces come to their final union. And in a work of art, which we can, you know, sort of compare to the whole opus, this is the completion of that work of art. It's final realization and form. And on a spiritual level, this is the complete integration of the entire process and understanding that could be equated with enlightenment or um, full spiritual realization. And during this phase, I talk about some different processes. So fixation is really where that coagulation reaches its final solidification in form. And the philosopher's stone, which is sort of the result of the whole process, and what I equate with the perfected imagination or the true imagination, the philosopher's stone becomes this indestructible stone of truth that we hold within us, this realization that can withstand the fire. It can't be destroyed. Um, it's indissoluble. Like we just, we have this realization and it's fully integrated and that remains with us. And the whole process is really, it's cyclical, right? Like when we reach the end, we find ourselves right at the beginning again. And I experienced this in a really visceral way, just as I finished writing this book, which, you know, years of work and dedication and focus and every day waking up and working on the book and knowing that that was my mission. And then suddenly it's done, right? The great work of my book was completed. And I went into a deep depression. I didn't know mm. what to do with myself. I was right back in the degrado. And I think this is really how it works. Like we go through these cycles and in an alchemical text, the final phase of the opus sort of reiterates within itself all four stages. So we're going through the negredo, albedo, citrinitas, and rubedo. And we can repeat this over and over and over again 
further refining and perfecting our stone and bringing it to its ultimate perfection so that it has the most um, perfect powers of transmutation, right? And I feel like that's what we're doing throughout our lives, going through these processes and getting more and more efficient with them and integrating them on deeper and deeper levels. It's not like you just reach the end of the great work and then it's done. We're, we're constantly evolving through it. So I don't know if that addresses your question. Um, Quite eloquently, in fact. And that leads me into another question for you. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're just going to bombard you with questions in this episode. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in alchemy, traditionally, and this goes back, you know, to Zos- Zosimos of Panopolis and ancient Egyptian alchemy, all the way through, you know, the Renaissance period in the Middle Ages and all of that. The seven planets are very important. We see it in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. We see it in, in Jakob Bama. Um, so my question for you is. Regarding the seven planetary rays in their microcosmic and macrocosmic aspects, what is their role in the transformative work of the visionary artist? Well, I think these seven rays or seven planetary spheres, as they're called sometimes, or the wandering stars, they're, they exist within us and they also exist up in the heavens. And they're affecting us whether we're conscious of it or not. And If we're going through life sort of unconsciously, then these planets are guiding us as fate, basically, and ruling over us. But we can, through understanding them, through integrating their lessons in an archetypal way, we can integrate them into our lives and harness them like a charioteer would do, harness them and through the visionary process bring them to life and give them the opportunity to evolve through us. And I practice this a lot in my work and I I see humanity sort of in this role of not only embodying the gods through art and sculpture and writing, but, you know, helping them to evolve to their highest, most exalted form. And in alchemy, they talk about these seven um, archetypes as the metals. So You've got lead, tin, iron, copper, uh, quicksilver, silver, and gold. And they exist within the earth, you know, within the body and within the unconscious in their raw state. And the work of the alchemist is to go within, to extract them, bring them into the light and help to refine them and transmute them into their most noble expression. And so I think we can look at this, you know, in the subtle body as the chakras and sort of the, the clearing and opening activation of the chakras that, you know, are formed by Hermes, the caduceus, the serpent spiraling up the spinal canal and merging in, in the bridal chamber of the brain and the third eye. Um, And we can look at it in a mythic sense as you know, the the gods and archetypes associated with those seven metals and associated with the chakras. So, you know, for instance, lead um, correlates with the the root chakra and with Saturn as an archetype and with any number of Saturnian archetypes that are present throughout various cultures. And the principle that I talked about with the negredo of rest and regeneration and death and that inward journey um, that's so vital and looking at the subtle body, that's really like the, the lowest chakra, right? It sits at the base of the spine or the perineum. And that's where that vital Kundalini energy rests that we're coaxing up, up the spine in the realization, spiritual realization of, of the self. So again, we're at the beginning of the work, the root chakra, which relates to our most basic primal instincts and survival instincts and our deep rooted fears and anxieties and fears about survival and the material world and finances and just the really, you know, the base of our being. And this is where we begin. 
And this rises up to the second chakra, which is related to tin and to Jupiter. And this re- represents a creative impulse and it correlates with all the sexual organs and um, the water element and that generative principle and the life force that wants to move up. And so this is sort of, you know, like Jupiter who rules the sacral chakra and who's corresponding, who corresponds with the metal tin is that creative deity and the creative spark, like lightning um, energy that wants to rise up. So from here, we rise up, we go to Mars in the solar plexus, and that relates to the metal iron. And here we come into contact with our personal power, our true will, um, our ego consciousness, our actions in the world, and things related to Mars, the Martian, Martian archetype that relates to the metal iron. So the warrior, um, that sort of you know, fiery impulse and drive and activation, um, and also the inner fires of transmutation that are so vital in alchemy. And so we see a correlation with the body and the digestive organs and the inner fire of digestion, our ability to process information, assimilate it, integrate it, and transform it through the creative process. And as we move up through the chakras, we get to the heart and the air element and the metal copper, which correlates with Venus. And this is sort of the the archetype of ideal beauty and the actual joy of creation and generation of forms, the multiplication of the creative impulse in the world. And Venus, I, I feel like in all of the archetypes, they can be expressed in both positive and negative ways, right? So in each of the chakras, there's a, a negative and a positive expression. And our work is to bring these to balance. And with Venus, there's really this sort of um, balance that needs to come into play between that um, desire and creative expression and also the part of us that um, can be corrupted, you know, just like the metal copper can be corrupted when exposed to like uh, air or water. It gets that like leprous green verdigris growing on it. And that can be a really generative thing to work with, a really potent material to work with, but it needs to be transmuted into its highest expression. And that's the case with all of the the different metals and all of the different planetary rays and archetypes. So anyway, moving up to the throat chakra, uh, we come to the metal quicksilver, which relates to Mercury and Hermes and this idea of the polarities of the caduceus and they come together in this narrow channel at the throat. And then from there they merge in the crown chakra and the third eye chakra. But the throat chakra is really about self-expression and speech, just like Hermes and Thoth and Mercury and our ability to, you know, express ourselves in the world in a truthful, authentic way. And so when this chakra is open, that's really flowing and we feel confident and all of the energies of lower chakras, which also correlate with the the four elements are unified by mercury in the throat. And this relates to the magician again, you know, the, who wields the four elements, who contains the powers of the elements in balance and is able to work with them and translate them into creative forms. And from here, this is where we really get to the the full realization of the entire um, set of energies coming up through the caduceus at the third eye. And that's ruled by the moon and correlates with the metal silver. And after that, the crown is correlated with the sun and with gold. And so we get this union of the sun and the moon, which is one of the main goals of alchemy and the union of the, the primal pair, the opposites. Sometimes they're talked about as uh, sulfur and mercury. And this happens within the bridal chamber of the brain in the third eye. And I see this as really the place of, of projection and our ability to project through our imagination into form and to create things directly 
through the imagination, just as the creator does to manifest things through our will and our desire, because our, all of our energies are aligned. We've balanced all of the chakras. Our Kundalini has risen up and is expressing itself through that third eye chakra and through the union of the third eye and the crown where the, the cosmic energies are coming down through the crown and all of the energies of the body are moving up and then we can really harness the full power and potential of our creative being. Very beautifully articulated. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I assume that this can be, this, this explanation can be found in your book as well. Is that, Mm -hmm. is it safe to assume that? Okay, great. Um, Something that I wanted to emphasize a little bit that I, I think is, is really important that I really like that you, you went there it's kind of this idea of of taking the middle path mm-hmm. when talking about the the planetary spheres because um, they don't have to be you don't have to take the gnostic view of the the spheres as being the archons and you must you know be dismissive of them and they're evil um, they they certainly can have that aspect um, like you were saying if you're just kind of walking through life in a fog um, they will control your destiny um, unbeknownst to you. I think that middle ground is super important. I really appreciate you going there with that. Yeah. Yeah. That actually, it reminds me of something that I read in um, GRS Mead in his version of the Corpus Hermeticum and his commentary that the harmony of the spheres, which is fate is really only evil. Apparently that it has a higher function. And I see this, you know, with vice and things like we don't necessarily want to just aim toward the good, like sometimes vice has a really powerful role to play in our own evolution and in the evolution of the cosmos. And so this sort of um, black and white view of good and evil, it just really isn't relevant in the hermetic sense. Mm -hmm. That's certainly how Jung felt. Um, I think Jung said something to the effect of, I would rather be whole than good. Yes. You know, Um, and my understanding of it is really that you have in the human soul a known and an unknown side, a conscious and an unconscious. There is a shadow. And since the human being is a microcosmic manifestation of the cosmic human, the anthropos, uh, you have this sort of analogical reciprocity between the two where there, there are unconscious or daimonic forces which draw us further into matter, and then there are heroic and angelic forces that lead us up into the synthesis with the cosmic reality. And yeah. so I think that every sphere has a divine and an arconic side, and it's really about right relationship. Yeah, so true. So true. How about... You know, you reference the Hermetica a lot, which is obviously a delight to us as devotees of Hermes. Um, how do the Hermetica and their earlier predecessors and their Hermopolitan and Memphite sort of theologies and cosmogenies, not so much cosmogenies as more more what I'm getting at is the, co- the Hermopolitan narrative of the cosmogenesis and the Memphite cosmogenesis. Um, to me, they both tie very hard into art you know uh if you look at ta he's the not only they use the word craftsman often but if you look at who ta was he was an artist he was known to be the god of artists and artisans and of course thoth hermes is uh deeply creative and so i was wondering um you know do you see those as relevant to your work as a creative visionary artist definitely i definitely do and I touch upon this in more in the first book, because that's really where I get into hermetic cosmogony and some comparison with the Egyptian theologies and cosmogonies. Um, so I think you mentioned, did you say the Heliopolitan? The Hermopolitan and the Memphite were what kind of came to my mind. Okay. Yeah. So the Hermopolitan, that's where we get the Ogdoad, right? This group of eight creator, creative deities. and Thoth is the Lord of the Ogdoed. And these four, well, actually it's eight deities, but it's four male-female pairs, right? So there's, you know, the same kind of active and passive principles, male-female, just like in alchemy, you know, and just like with the four elements, they have 
positive and negative active and passive expressions. And in the Hermetica, if you compare it with the Hermetica, there's, you know, the, the eight spheres. So there's the seven spheres of the harmony, but then there's the eighth sphere that's above the harmony that transcends the harmony. And it's called the creative or the formative sphere. And so I sort of, you know, these eight deities of the Octoad, I see as a, in relationship to that. And that when we can overcome the harmony within us, we become masters of our own destiny. And then we can rise up, ascending through the spheres, rise up to the eighth sphere and become co-creators with the divine, you know, aligning our, our personal will with the divine will harnessing all of our energies and directing them in one divine direction. And from here, like that ability to manifest, to create through the imagination is fully realized. And there are further spheres beyond this, but I feel like that's really like um, what we're all working towards is to be in that place of complete creative flow. Right. And the magician has this, he's able to, weave back and forth between the conscious and the unconscious, just like Mercury and Thoth able to travel between the worlds, between heaven and the underworld and humanity and transmit messages from above to below and from below to above. And when we're really in that place of creative flow, that's what's going on. We're constantly moving back and forth between active and passive states in a very fluid way. And we're focused and completely in alignment with divine will in surrender to that. And, you know, I experience this sometimes through my work, not all the time, but when I do, it's the most amazing and profound experience to be in that state of focus and flow. And that's what I see as being the eighth sphere and related to those eight creative deities. Like we're getting in touch with that um, ability to create the universe. Well, it's really interesting too, because if you move, if you go either up through the seven to the eighth, or if you begin at the eighth and go down from the eighth through the seven, you have a replication of the alchemical process because the eight is the undifferentiated noon, which is very much the prima materia. And then, you know, the, the, the black light gives, gives birth to the white light, which separates into the seven rays and then the cosmos is formed from that, or you, and to to um, to use the term Martina or uh, San Martin used to when you experience reintegration, it's a process of moving up that ladder mm-hmm. to the Ogdoad. And mm-hmm. you know it's interesting because Hermes is really the only Olympian who's said to be have power over fate. You know, the, if you look at if you look at the myths, um, the fates rule all you know, but Aramis is above fate. Why? Because fate is the seven, the cosmic septenary, the harmony, and the Ogdoad is above the harmony. And I would say to our listeners that if you're dealing with an especially painful or difficult manifestation of fate, you can invoke Aramis. And if your request, I think, is justified, then he certainly has the power to change things for the better. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. So how about this? It seems to me, and I, I don't feel like in the in your presence I have the right to claim that I'm an artist. So, but it seems to me that in the process of creating art, the art creates you. There's a symbiosis. It's like it's almost like you're giving birth to something that is yourself, and then it's working on you as you're working on it. Do you do you does that do you have that experience? Oh, definitely, definitely. Like I mentioned before, sometimes one of my paintings can take months or years to complete. And a large part of that is because I have to be going through these processes of evolution and growth and development as the art progresses. And it's not just about like finishing the painting. The painting is working on me as I'm working on it. And sometimes I can't work on it because there's things I have to do internally in order for the painting to be completed. And so I'll reach these points in a painting where the dialogue between the painting and I kind of, you know, becomes quiet and I don't know where to go from there. I'm not sure what the next step is. And so I have to step back and go through a process of gestation and allow 
things to change and transform within me. And then I'll reach a place through my own spiritual process where suddenly I'll know what the next step is. And sometimes that can take, you know, months or even years where I'm not working on a painting and it's just waiting for me to come back to it. But when I come back to it, often there's this like sort of divine timing that happens. And I can see, you know, like I remember, I think there was a painting. I don't remember which one it was, but it was a a Mars themed painting. And I conceptualized it, you know, as being a Mars painting from the beginning and had to step away from it because of, you know, needing to process things internally for a while. And it took me two years to come back to it. And when I came back to it and I started working on it again, I was feeling inspired. I realized it had been two years and that's, you know, the period of Mars's um, revolution, two years around the sun, right? That's pretty awesome. So what do you think? I mean, it's great that art can be, can have this kind of biofeedback kind of symbiotic relationship. What about for, what do you think about non-artists or people who don't have a medium that they they work with, um, what kind of, where do they get their feedback or where could they get their feedback from in order to know that they mm-hmm. are truly ready to move on to the next stage? Cause oftentimes we have the habit of fooling ourselves and thinking that we're ready when we're really not but with, in your case, with the art, you, you couldn't move on. Yeah. So any, any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a lot of ways that we can engage with, with the subtle aspects of reality to, to see where we're at, to gauge where we're at and, where we're at in these processes, you know, and if we're ready to move on and if they're transitioning. And one of the main ways that I would suggest is working with dreams. And that can be a really, really creative process in itself. Um, So first of all, like learning how to remember your dreams, if you're not in the habit of it, that's really important. And then beginning the process of recording your dreams and remembering them in more and more detail. And we can also communicate with our dreams. So on the one hand, we can work with interpreting and there's different ways to do that, but we can also incubate our dreams with different ideas and questions for our subconscious or unconscious and receive feedback in that way, receive information. And I feel like these processes, these alchemical processes are really truly reflected in the dream world in such a powerful way. So I would say that's one of the main ways, but everything that we do can be done in a creative way. You know, the way that we engage in our, any work that we're doing in the world, the way that we engage in relationships, um, simple things, you know, the way that we arrange our, our house and our objects of the material world, um, cooking a meal, like anything that we're doing is a creative process. And so there's an infinite number of ways to apply these processes. It doesn't just have to be through art. Beautiful answer. I was worried that that question might've been too tough, <laughs> but you had a great response. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, because what it really means is that it ties back to the fact that the human being has a seed or spark, the sphincter of the divine within. So whenever we engage the creative process, we're actuating the divine principle within us. And if we do it consciously and intentionally, then we can participate in the act of the constant reformation of the world. And we can attempt to establish the good, the beautiful, and the true, even yeah. in our from everywhere from our personal relationships to cleaning and organizing our house to drawing or painting or writing or dancing or running or, you know, running or wrestling or mm-hmm you know, going out into nature and heart, just the, I think that an unfortunate side effect of some of the dominant paradigms that have ruled the world, the Western world for so long is the, um, the desacralization of the human being. The idea that the human being is a subservient slave designed to simply be obedient to a sort of irreverent divine law where in reality, if you look at the original Egyptian conception, human beings were were born with a were were formed from the start, but with a creative okay. gift, and it, where it, we have the same gift of formation in miniature that the that the God has has in the in the different levels of being, and I think that in that is is something truly sacred. But you almost have to deprogram yourself and go through a detox from 
this very Philip K. Dick way that we are indoctrinated from an early age into disbelief. You know, it's it's such an irony that the the that the enlightenment was called the enlightenment because it's actually the opposite of the enlightenment. It's like the endarkenment. You know, exactly. it, it, it's crazy. I mean, it, it always blows my mind. It's like, wow, one of the worst things to happen to human development is treated as if it's like something that was this great illumination. It's crazy if you think about it. I do feel like that's an important part of the process though, right? Like maybe before the enlightenment, there was a lot of unconsciousness or just sort of existing in this sort of um, unconscious place. and. So again, coming back to the balance, we want the balance of the unconscious and the conscious, the irrational and the rational. So it just went a little too far in the <laughs> direction of the rational. So yeah. our work is we're still trying to bring that to balance, you know. Well, and 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 I mean there's so much there. Um, but I do want to ask you this. Do you consider art as a theurgic method of ascent? I do. I do. And I, um, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of my own process um, in the sense of rising up through the spheres and also in the sense of art being talismanic um, in, in which we're drawing the energy of the spheres down into creative form. But the way I see it, there's different purposes to art. So yeah, there's the divine ascent that we can effect through the artistic process. And that comes in with deconditioning the mind from these fixed concepts and beliefs, integrating the seven planetary archetypes, understanding how they're playing out their, their mythic stories through our lives, integrating them, um, transmuting them into their most ennobled expression. Um, and we can do that through art, through the creative process, but there's different levels to it. So if you're familiar with the process of automatism or like automatic drawing, automatic writing, this is a way that we can sort of reach into the unconscious or allow the unconscious to freely express itself. So the point is to really put aside the rational critical mind and allow this unconscious um, expression to come forth uninhibited. And I feel like this is a really important part of the process of knowing the self exploring what's hidden within us, our shadow aspects, letting them come out through the creative process and whatever results, you know, the point is not to create amazing art when you're doing automatic processes or amazing, amazing writing, but to um, discover things from within. And I feel like that's a really vital part of the process. And on the other side of it, um, as we're going through our spiritual process, we can then begin to infuse our work with divine ideals. And this is another level of it. So this is like, as we're learning, growing, evolving spiritually, we're integrating the information within, but that integration can be helped by externalizing these truths in, in our art form. And, you know, if we're not an artist, this can also be externalized in our life and integrating it into our life by by making changes, by, you know, honoring these energies and these lessons that we're receiving from the spiritual world. And as an artist, the more the divine truth that we're coming into contact with can be transmitted into our work, but it requires that we're also doing this work of exploring the unconscious. We can't just do one side of it. Nice. Yeah. As, as far as the book goes, do you have exercises or are you, are you leading the reader through different methods for kind of working, working through this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the second book, uh, the Royal marriage of art and alchemy. I talk a lot about the different art movements of the 19th and 20th centuries, like romanticism, symbolism, Dada and surrealism and how these artists sort of were inspired by alchemy and also how they integrated alchemical and hermetic um, ideas into their work and and even how they live them in their personal lives. And then the second part of the book kind of draws upon those different art periods and many of the different artists as examples of how these processes of alchemy have been expressed and explored. 
And during those four chapters that I go through the four stages of the magnum opus, I give different exercises and ways to move through each of the four stages. So for instance, I think I mentioned before with the the stage of integration, um, the citrinitas, active imagination can be used to, to help bring consciousness into the unconscious and to gain deeper insights about what's going on within us. And the albedo, um, the process of purification and dissolution, that's really about dream work and remembering our dreams and being able to work with them in a practical way. And with the final stage of the rubedo, um, that's where I talk about active, not active imagination, but um, astral projection and projection through the imagination for the manifestation of different things that we want to experience or cultivate in our lives. So yeah, there's a lot of different exercises and a lot of um, charts to help understand the information. Cool. You have talked about um, how one of the most important things we can do is to find out what myth governs our life what archetype governs our life and um i think personally this is one of i totally i came to understand well, maybe especially in the past five years how crucial this is you know uh, we each have an archetype that it om- almost gives form to our our identity our, our soul and that archetype's myth is played out in our life and when we when we come to see that, then we can come to really, I think, interact with our life in a productive way and even understand how our relationships with other people and spiritual beings and spiritual reality are predicated on the fact that our soul is manifest in the pattern of the archetype, which then externalizes in our life as the form of the myth of that archetype in some way or another. So I was wondering, um, how does this kind of mythic reality and the the lived myth of the realized archetype play out in your life as a person, as an artist, as a magician? Well said. Yeah, I completely agree. And I don't know that I would say I have one particular archetype for my life, but I've definitely gone through phases with different archetypes. And in particular, Venus seems to have played a large role in my life. Um, The Venusian archetype related to the Sumerian goddess Inanna, and particularly the the journey through the underworld, you know. And so I've spent a lot of time reflecting on that and um, working with Venus. And a lot of my paintings incorporate Venus, and you'll see her symbol throughout. Um, (laughs) But I see her as, you know... She, like the evening star, Hesperus, right? Like she draws us into the darkness and she also brings us into the dawn. She brings us into the light. So there's this necessary journey into the underworld to confront the shadow. And I've done a lot of work with that. And I always, anytime Venus is going retrograde and um, transitioning from evening star to morning star, I go through this really intense process. And I really, really, I feel like I'm right there with the Nana, like hanging like a piece of rotting meat on the wall of the underworld and stripped of all my powers. And you know, the thing is, I mean, Venus is a goddess of fire, which people don't realize a lot of the time she's directly connected to the fire that knits together the cosmos because love is what keeps everything in a unity. But at the same time, she's connected to the madness that comes from, from desire. And, um, you know, she's associated with love, but she's also called, I think, man killer. And she has this, you know, really dark side as well. But even that is an initiatory thing. It's, it's this morning and even evening star duality. And then there's a really interesting trinity between Venus, Adonis, and Eros in the Orphic scriptures and the Orphic hymns especially. And I think in a cultic sense, you know, whether it's, whether you call them Tammuz or Adonis, um, you know, it's, there's, there's Venus, there's Adonis and there's Eros, who's also Phanes, you know, Protogonos who hatch from the cosmic egg. So there's this, there's this thing, Dom and I were talking about this recently where again, yeah, you can look at the deity as an archon, 
but then you're kind of missing this deeper Gnostic dimension of how Venus is, for instance, a very Sophianic figure, especially if you consider like Ishtar and her descent and how it's analogous to the fall of Sophia. And um, then, then it's impossible not to notice the obvious correlations between Christ and Adonis, you know, uh, or, or Harpocrates and Eros. And I mean, in Alexandria, we have images of Isis, Aphrodite and uh, Eros Harpocrates that were used in the mysteries. So, I mean, there's so much depth to her and, but it's also so easy to get lost in it and, and obsessed with it and immersed in it and not able to pull yourself out of it. It's true. It's true. It's hard because it will suck you in and it will hold you there. And then it's like, it's really hard with the goddess because she holds you. The further you go in, the further you're in and you can't, can't get out. <laughs> yeah. I think I've experienced that a little bit. <laughs> and I think there's some real wisdom in what you were saying earlier about um, Venus in retrograde, using that time as a time for growth. Cause people are constantly freaking out about Mercury retrograde and, you know, Mars and Saturn, they're the malefics and you don't want to do anything with them. But, but I think that's pretty short-sighted. I, I think there's some real work you could do with Mars and Saturn as well as the retrograde periods. Oh, absolutely. I um, had a recent experience with the Mercury retrograde. I think it was in the last few weeks of January. And my manuscript for the second book was due February 3rd, which was the day that the retrograde ended. So the final weeks of like really intense revision and editing were happening during that retrograde period. Like, you know, super late nights working on the book, trying to get it into like its best possible shape to submit. And um, I was, you know, when I saw the retrograde was coming up, I was like, oh no, that's right before the book is due. And then I realized like, you know, Mercury is going backwards and this is a time of, of reviewing you know, mm -hmm. and totally it's perfect for that. So I sort of embraced it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, that I need to actually start wrapping up fairly soon as much as I'm loath to do so because I have enjoyed this immensely. Oh, this has been great. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but I do want to say, first of all, again, please accept our gratitude for, um, gracing us with your presence it was truly an honor to discuss things with, with a true mystic and um, especially considering, you know, th it's very clear you have dedicated a very long time to study of these things. And it's also clear that you've, you, you are, you are a practitioner. You are not just a um, student and there's nothing wrong with just studying. I don't, I don't condemn people for that. Um, but what I want to, where I want to go now is like, where can people find your art? Um, where can people find you? How can people learn more about your process? Um, how can people find out about your books? And, you know, do you do anything else that you want to let people know about? Well, um, you can find me on my website, which is just my full name, marlena 7 bramnercom And I also have an Instagram, which is at m7artist. So the letter M, the number seven artist, and I post a lot there and keep people, you know, up to date on anything that I have going on. That's really the best place to, to get the most up to date information is Instagram. I'm also on Facebook and, but I really just sort of share directly from Instagram to Facebook. I, I can't handle more than one social media obligation. Um, but yeah, I, I also send out a newsletter, which you can sign up for on my website. And so anytime I have anything big going on, I announce it through the newsletter. Um, right now, I'm not teaching or anything, but I do intend to have classes again in the future. And right now, I'm just trying to get through the, the processes with editing the books and getting those out in the world. And um, yeah, I, I offer... Um, spontaneous poetry if anyone's interested in that that's something that i do on the side and you can request poems on any topic that you like through my website um, that's one way to interact with me um, and i have a patreon where people can support me if they like my work and want to just contribute to the further development of what i'm working on and um, there's any 
there's different levels people can subscribe on from a dollar on upward. So at the dollar level, you get access to the blog and then there's different rewards beyond that. So yeah, those are all the ways to find me. So yeah, thank you very much. And you have, you have a book coming out. When is it, when is it due to come out? Yeah. The first book is called Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy. And that one comes out in July of this year. And it's with um, published with Inner Traditions. So you can actually pre-order the hardcover now. If you go to the Inner Traditions website and type in my name, you'll find it. And the second book is still in process. So I'm not sure when that is going to come out exactly, but it should be towards the end of this year. Awesome. And is that a, a part two? Yeah, they go together. Okay. Definitely. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We truly appreciate it. This has been a really interesting conversation. This has been wonderful. It's such a pleasure to talk with both of you. And I just really appreciate that you wanted to have me on. And truly, I'm I'm honored to be here. Love your podcast. Cool. Thank you. Well, we, we love your work. I mean, so the feeling's mutual. Okay, that was Marlena Seven Bremner, and we were delighted to have her on the show. She was a wonderful guest, articulate, erudite, and uh, wise. Very interesting conversation. I love the confluence of art and spirituality, art and magic, art and alchemy. I mean, it's really a perennially intriguing subject, and I think it's always worth investigation and exploration. Her art is also just incredible, breathtaking visionary art. So I am so glad that she decided to come on the show, grace us with her presence, and illuminate us with intriguing conversations. Yeah, it was great. It's amazing that she's a self-taught artist that didn't start painting until you know later in life, which is which is amazing and um, just speaks to her dedication and you know, the work that she's put in the practice, many, many hours, I'm sure, um, learning that craft. So, uh, yeah, I would would highly recommend our listeners go check out her art. It's, it's really, really cool. And if you're into what we do here, you'll definitely like it. Um, I'm guessing. And yeah, she's, yeah, a very sincere person. You can tell she's a very serious practitioner. I like that. She's not afraid of psychology. And she, you know, mentioned young in, in the modern uh, culture right now, these are not names that are popular for whatever reason, you know, we've, we've got this really hard swing to this whole kind of spirit models, you know, psychological model dichotomy, which is kind of a false narrative. Um, and anybody who throws out young is, is really missing a lot. And it's it's really to their detriment. Yeah, the people who criticize Jung, it's clear they've never actually read Jung. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's just stale. The whole spirit model, psych- psychological model, kind of debate. Um, it's time to move on. I think. Yeah, well, you know the the thing is, you have people like Marlena who is serious, genuine, and practicing what they preach. And, you know, she's not sitting on Facebook or whatever, trying to trying to have debates with people about these topics. She's just living it, doing it, making it happen. And that's what we're dedicated to here. That's what we've always been dedicated to is those people, those, those people and those ideas that are real, that are genuine, that are out there in the trenches doing the work and too busy to spend time on developing internet personalities because they're too engaged with actually doing the work. And that's the key right there, right there. Yeah. So again, uh, very happy she came on. It was a really fun conversation and I wish her the best with her upcoming books. I look forward to uh, getting them when they're, when they're out and available. Yep. And her tradition is, once again, her traditions are hitting a home run once again with, with publishing her as an author. I mean, she really knows her stuff and the way that she articulates things is accessible and easy to understand and interpret. 
despite the fact that we're dealing with really profound material. She's very good at translating, and that is one of the that is one of the uh, names of Hermes, anyways, Hermenudes, which is interpreter. And so the identifying characteristic of a true hermetist, one of them, I should say, is certainly the the talent for interpreting things so that others can understand them and access them. Okay, for this week's book review, I'm just going to grab a book that I'm kind of in the middle of right now. Um, it's a it's a newer translation of the Lotus Sutra. Um, it's the Threefold Lotus Sutra is the title, a modern translation for contemporary readers, uh, translated by uh, Michio Shinazaki, Brooke Zephorin, and David Earhart. And it really is a modern translation which is great because um, if you go to the bookstore, you pick up any other uh, translations of the Lotus Sutra, a lot of the language is going to be really daunting to kind of trudge through. They did a lot of work to make this accessible and readable. And they also uh, formulated it in a way that it was um, easy to recite out loud uh, for recitations uh, for practice. So it is, it was written with, actual practice in mind the way that they uh they put it together and it's always great to have multiple translators on a work like this because that's kind of traditionally how it was done uh, originally so um as far as the lotus sutra itself very fundamental mahayana buddhist text definitely if, if you're interested in buddhism you need to read it it's it's a it's a really important book to read um especially if you're in the Mahayana kind of vein of, of study. Um, what they cover in a nutshell, I mean, there's many chapters in the Lotus Sutra, but a lot of talk about the Bodhisattva path, where as earlier in Buddhism, Bodhisattva was thought of just as the Buddha himself. Later, such as with Mahayana practices and teachings, the Bodhisattva path expanded to be available to anyone and all people. And there were hundreds of thousands of bodhisattvas of the past, of the present, of the future. So it really kind of changed the perspective um, of practice, which was kind of groundbreaking. Um, so there's that. They, they concentrate a lot on that, becoming a bodhisattva. Um, anyone can. And um, just realizing your inherent potential is a huge um, emphasis in the Lotus Sutra. Um, it's very Gnostic in a way. Um, you are kind of an heir. You, you have a birthright um, to be a, a Buddha, essentially. And texts like the Lotus Sutra are helping you kind of wipe away all the muck and grime um, to find that kind of bright, shining center that you already possess. So, yeah. Highly recommend this particular translation. It's really, uh, like I said, easy to read and a lot of important lessons inside. In addition, um, a nice companion text would be um, a book by Thich Nhat Hanh, which everyone I'm sure is familiar with. He wrote a uh, commentary on the Lotus Sutra called Opening the Heart of the Cosmos. And it's very typical of his style, very gentle kind of walkthrough of a somewhat difficult text. He's very practical. If you've ever read his stuff before, he is very much about application right now. So that fits right in line with the overall message of the Lotus Sutra in general. So a little long-winded there, but highly recommend the Threefold Lotus Sutra, a modern translation for contemporary readers um, by Michio uh, Shinazaki, Brooke Zephorin, and David Earhart. All right, everyone, you can find us on the usual outlets, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, etc. 